less noticed in that video was what he said here. He said, quote, we are having a much harder time with Hispanic voters, and if the Hispanic voting bloc becomes as committed to the Democrats as the African American voting bloc has in the past, he said, we're in trouble as a party, and I think as a nation. <laughs> President Obama talked about the same issue when he thought he was off the record, talking to the Des Moines Register editorial board. This was an off the record interview that the Des Moines Register later persuaded him to put on the record. But when he thought this would not be public, he said, quote, should I win a second term, a big reason I will win a second term is because the Republican nominee and the Republican Party have so alienated the fastest growing demographic group in the country, the Latino community. And he said, this is a relatively new phenomenon. George Bush and Karl Rove were smart enough to understand the changing nature of America. So in 2008, Barack Obama carried two thirds of the Latino vote. Does anybody know how much he carried this year? Exactly, three quarters. And long term, the greatest fear for Republicans nationally is that what happened to California will happen to the entire country. It's hard to imagine this now, but California voted Republican in six consecutive presidential elections, all the way up to 1992 when it voted for Bill Clinton. Now, today, Democrats have a super majority in the California state legislature, and Republicans cannot get elected to statewide office. Arnold Schwarzenegger notwithstanding. <laughs> top California Republicans believe this is because the party alienated minority voters, and top Republicans in Washington fear the same thing could be happening right now around the country. So, what does this have to do with President Obama's agenda? Well, one of his top priorities in his first term was immigration reform, and he was unable to get it done. Republicans were so opposed to it that he could not even pass the small slice of immigration reform known as the DREAM Act. And now, Marco Rubio, your home state senator, who during the campaign talked about self-deportation, which was something President Obama described as making life so miserable for folks that they will leave. Now Marco Rubio has put forth an immigration plan that looks not all that different from President Obama's immigration plan. Rick Santorum, who was to the right of Mitt Romney during the primaries, said last week on ABC that he thinks Republicans are ready to play ball in immigration. The week after the election, Sean Hannity said he has evolved on the issue of immigration. <laughs> that was the word he used. But there's a catch, as there always is. Granting citizenship to undocumented workers makes millions and millions of Latinos who are not currently voters suddenly voters. And if Latinos remain democratic voters, signing on to a plan that gives millions of Latinos citizenship could be a very bad thing for the Republican Party. But opposing a plan that gives immigrants citizenship could be a very bad thing for the Republican Party. So this week, we saw John Boehner saying that President Obama's goal is to annihilate the Republican Party. <laughs> and when you look at the trap that he has set up for them, or that the country set up for them, frankly, on immigration, that doesn't seem so far-fetched. I mean, either they support a plan to give the Democratic Party millions of new voters, or they oppose that plan, thereby alienating the fastest growing demographic group in the country for generations to come. We'll have to see what happens. <laughs> so I, I've also been talking about what prominent Republicans, Republican leaders think. But there's this whole tension within the Republican Party, as we saw in the Plan B vote. 2010 and 2012 were both years that Republicans were supposed to take back the Senate. More Democrats were retiring than Republicans. These were Republican wave elections, and yet in both years, Republicans failed to take back the Senate. In fact, this year, Democrats gained seats in the Senate, and that's largely because the Tea Party grassroots didn't march in the direction that the party leadership wanted them to march. You look at Richard Murdoch, the, the, the Tea Party candidate for Senate in Indiana, who ousted the popular centrist Senator Richard Lugar, the foreign policy titan, Democrats should not have won the Indiana Senate seat, but because Richard Murdoch talked about legitimate rape, 
That was Todd Akin, right. I thought, wait a second, I'm confusing my two Tea Party Senate candidates. Richard Murdoch was the one who said, even when life begins in that horrible situation of rape, it is something that God intended to happen. Giving d Democrats a gift. Then there was Todd Akin in Missouri, another seat the Democrats should not have won. He was the one who referred to legitimate rape. So Republican Party leadership might want to play ball with President Obama on immigration, but it's not at all clear that the rank and file will allow it. And I think one of the most interesting sto stories, excuse me, of the next four years will be what happens within the Republican Party. Some have described it as tensions, some have described it as civil war. John Boehner has acknowledged that President Obama is going to do everything he can to exploit it. Now, I don't want you to walk away from this thinking Republicans are going to take control of the House in 2014. Uh, sorry, that Democrats are going to regain control of the House in 2014. For a couple of reasons, they're not going to. First of all, midterm elections always favor the party that does not control the White House. That's Drew stretching back for years, with the one exception of 2002, when in a post-9-11 wave, Republicans actually gained seats. The other reason that Republicans won't lose control of the House in 2014, aside from redistricting, which we talked about a little bit earlier, is that midterm elections fit a very specific voter profile. Midterm voters tend to be more well-educated, older, more well-established in their community. Uh, according to the pollster Mark Blumenthal of the Huffington Post, retirees are three times more likely to vote in midterms than college students. Obviously, college students favor Democrats, retirees tend to favor Republicans. 2014 will not be a year that costs Republicans the House. So the question is, if we still have divided government for the entire second term of Barack Obama's presidency, what can get done? Well, I've talked a little bit about these upcoming financial crises that the country is going to have to face. There are three of them coming right up. The debt ceiling, which is uh, you know, reaching the limit of the nation's borrowing authority. If Congress doesn't raise it, the country could default on its debts. The last time this happened, 2011, we lost our AAA credit rating. Republicans have already moved back from their insistence that Democrats or that Congress find $1 in spending cuts for every dollar of raising the debt ceiling. They say they're going to pass a clean debt ceiling bill for three months. So it looks like they may play ball a little bit, although strategically it also looks like that might just be a way of reordering these three fiscal crises because the consequences of not raising the debt ceiling are far worse than the consequences of these other two crises. The other two crises are the sequester, the deep spending cuts to domestic and military programs that I talked about, and then also uh, the, the, the government funding bill that runs out that could cause a government shutdown. So this is a series of crises that we're going to see in the next few months, and we'll see whether Congress is able to tackle them or whether the government shuts down. We now know that Joe Biden in 2011 argued for a government shutdown because having lived through that in the 90s, he said once Republicans get a taste of what that's really like, they'll step into line pretty darn quick. So we may actually see a government shutdown, and we'll see if Republicans respond the way Biden expects them to. While these fiscal debates are playing out, the next biggest thing on President Obama's agenda, and this is not just one more item on his to-do list, he says he will put the entire weight of his presidency behind it, is gun control. And to me, gun control is a lesson in how unexpected events can shape a presidency. I remember during the last few years of covering the Obama White House, going with him to the memorial service in Tucson, Arizona. I remember covering the mass shootings in Aurora, Colorado, and other mass shootings. And I remember doing a story six months after Tucson, where the headline of the story was, gun control advocates chide Obama for inaction. At the White House press briefing that day on the sixth anniversary, I asked Jay Carney, you know, President Obama said he wants to enforce existing laws more, uh, more strictly. He wants to have a task force address gun control. It's six months later. What have you done? And Carney said, well, there's a, there's a task force at the Justice Department that's meeting, and we expect them to have recommendations very soon. Well, they didn't have any recommendations until a year and a half later after the Newtown shooting. In fact, the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence gave President Obama a grade of F on his first term. But Newtown changed everything. Not only did it spur President Obama to put gun control at the top of his agenda, it also changed public opinion about gun control. It made the impossible suddenly politically, potentially achievable. And so in the month after Newtown, Vice President Biden met with 
more than 200 different interest groups, from video game manufacturers to the NRA to mental health groups to victims, survivors groups. And President Obama, one month after the Newtown shootings, rolled out his agenda, which included 23 executive steps that he could take without Congress, that frankly he could have taken four years ago, right when he was elected. This is everything from strengthening the criminal background database to improving mental health services to getting schools to come up with plans to address gun violence, emergency response plans. And then he also had an agenda for Congress, which might be a heavier lift. It ranges from the extremely controversial, such as limiting assault weapons, renewing the assault weapons ban, to the much less controversial, like expanding background checks to encompass every sale of a gun. Right now, background checks only encompass sales of guns from licensed gun dealers. If I sell somebody a gun on Craigslist, I don't have to do a background check. He'd like to change the law. That's much more popular with the American people than the assault weapons ban. It might still be tough to get through Congress, but politically, even if it doesn't get through Congress, it'll be a win for President Obama because it's so popular politically uh, that by pushing it, if it fails in Congress, once again, he's able to divide the Republicans and paint them as intransigents who are out of touch with the American people. So it may get done, it may not get done, but much like immigration, I think it could be a win-win for President Obama politically either way. Another big item on his to-do list for his second term is gay rights. I think many people were just dumbfounded when in his second inaugural address on Monday, he had this line about Seneca Falls, Selma, and Stonewall, tying three distinct fights into one alliterative arc. Seneca Falls, of course, was the convention in 1848 that was pivotal in getting women the right to vote. Selma was the 1960s flashpoint in the fight for racial equality. And Stonewall is the name of a gay bar where in 1969 drag queens rioted, sparking the modern gay rights movement. So for President Obama to link those three events was kind of unbelievable. Uh, I spoke to the president of HRC, the Human Rights Campaign, a gay rights group, for a story that I did about this earlier this week. He told me he was sitting about 10 rows back, and he said he listened to that part of the speech, quote, with the biggest smile on my face and, quite frankly, a knot in my throat. He said, growing up in a small town in Arkansas where I never knew that I knew another gay person, he said, I'm not sure I thought I'd see that day so soon. And that statement by the president capped a really landmark year in gay rights. In 2012, for the first time, the three states that had gay marriage on the ballot all approved it, Maryland, Maine, and Washington. Did I say oh, not? In 2012, in this year's election, um, Minnesota rejected a measure that would have put a gay marriage ban in the Constitution. To be fair, 30 states have such a ban in the Constitution, but the trend lines are moving. A state elected an openly gay senator for the first time in American history, Wisconsin, electing uh, Tammy Baldwin. Uh, and of course, in May, Barack Obama became the first US president to endorse same-sex marriage. And public opinion has changed too. Almost every pollster now shows that for the first time in American history, proponents of same-sex marriage outnumber opponents. And the numbers have changed unbelievably quickly. So what does this mean for public policy? Well, President Obama may actually not have a whole lot to do on same-sex marriage this year. But the nine Supreme Court justices who were sitting right behind him when he said that line about same-sex marriage, they have a lot on their plate. In March, they are hearing two hugely consequential cases, the biggest cases about gay rights in more than a decade. One of them tests the legality of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. This is the law that says federal benefits given to opposite-sex married couples cannot be given to same-sex married couples even if those couples are legally married in, those homes, in their home state. So that law will either be upheld or overturned by the Supreme Court. And the other law that is coming up before the Supreme Court in March is Prop 8. Prop 8 is the law prohibiting gay marriage in California. And this is such an interesting story because the two lawyers who are arguing that case, Ted Olson and David Boyce, argued against each other in Bush versus Gore. Ted Olson was George W. Bush's solicitor general and is largely responsible for President George W. Bush being in the White House, having won Bush versus Gore. David Boyce is a liberal lawyer who defended Al Gore in that case. The two of them, two of the best Supreme Court lawyers in the country, have teamed up for this case, and I hope somebody is writing the screenplay. <laughs>
So in March, the Supreme Court is going to decide those two cases that could have a huge impact on gay rights stretching decades into the future. Another big item on the president's agenda that frankly shocked everyone listening to his inaugural address is climate change. He talked about climate change barely at all in the campaign. He devoted one sentence to it in his DNC uh, convention acceptance speech. And yet, in the State of the Union address, he spent eight sentences talking about climate change. That's more than he devoted to any other single topic in the entire speech. What did I say? Did I say State of the Union? Thank you. State of the Union is next month. Inaugural was Monday. In his inaugural address, he spent eight sentences talking about climate change. We'll see how many he spends in the State of the Union. Um, cap and trade was unable to get through Congress in his first term. And frankly, nobody believes that it can get through Congress in his second term. There is just too much opposition from Republicans. But it turns out there is a lot that this president can do without going through Congress when it comes to climate change. The White House has made clear that in the president's next term, he is going to order the EPA to issue much harsher rules on regulating greenhouse emissions. Now those rules will likely be challenged in court, but they are rules that have been sort of lingering in the bowels of the EPA for a very, very long time that the president is now going to act on. In the president's first term, he got Detroit to agree to record-setting new rules for, uh, for emissions for vehicles. More miles per gallon than cars have ever been able to get before. Well, in the next term, he plans to do the same thing for household appliances and other energy-emitting devices. And perhaps most importantly, one of the biggest energy consumers in the country is the Pentagon. And the Pentagon is under the thumb of the Commander-in-Chief. And so if Barack Obama in the next four years orders the Pentagon to become more energy efficient, whether that means replacing light bulbs, or whether that means using solar and wind power, or whether that means finding more energy efficient tanks and drones, then that's what the Pentagon is going to have to do. And frankly, if the Pentagon spends four years going down that road, even if a Republican president takes office four years from now, they're not likely to go back to the way they did it before. It's just a huge waste of money. So speaking of the Pentagon, we haven't even touched on foreign affairs. <laughs> it looks bleak right now. I mean, you've all seen what's been happening in Mali. And I have to give credit to Mitt Romney. During the foreign policy debate, he talked about Islamists taking over Mali. And a lot of people watching the debate at home, I think, said, huh? I'm sorry, where? What? Nobody's talking about Mali. What is this? And in fact, he knew what he was talking about. The militias who had defended Muammar Gaddafi in Libya took their weapons and ran to Mali and helped out the Islamists there after Muammar Gaddafi fell. And now we have a real crisis in neighboring Algeria. There was this horrible hostage situation where American hostages were killed working at this uh, gas facility in the desert. Uh, we have uncertainty in, uh, with, with Mohamed Morsi in Egypt, not to mention Syria, where Bashar al-Assad has killed 60,000 of his own people, still does not seem to be going anywhere. And even when he does go somewhere, we have no idea what kind of government will replace him. The Arab Spring, which looked so hopeful and which still has a lot of potential for hope, looks pretty scary right now. And I haven't even mentioned Iran, China, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, tensions with Russia. So what do we expect from President Obama on that front in the next four years? This morning in the Washington Post, E.J. Dion, the columnist, had a really interesting turn of phrase. He talked about how Ronald Reagan always projected peace through strength. Meaning if the United States displayed a forceful show of power, the world would be a peaceful place. And E.J. Dion argued that President Obama is advocating not for peace through strength, but for strength through peace. That when the U.S. commits a huge footprint and billions of dollars to places overseas, we sometimes cause more harm than good but that by working with our allies, 
by negotiating, even with people who we might think to be bad guys, we can achieve strength. And that may or may not ultimately work out, but I think it's a pretty good description of the course that President Obama is charting right now. And I see no better evidence of that than a threesome of national security appointees that he announced a few weeks ago. John Kerry, to, run the Secretary, to be Secretary of State, Chuck Hagel, to be Secretary of Defense, and John Brennan, to run the CIA. Now, John Kerry and Chuck Hagel both served in Vietnam. If Hagel's confirmed to run the Defense Department, he will be the first enlisted man ever to run the Pentagon. He was wounded twice during the war, served with his brother there. Both Kerry and Hagel know the extreme cost of long drawn out wars, the cost in dollars, the cost in lives, the cost to America. And they don't like it. And they would like to keep America from committing to things like that in the future. One thing that goes without saying that I, I, I should have mentioned, one of the biggest foreign policy marks of President Obama's first term, pulling American troops out of Iraq and beginning the withdrawal from Afghanistan. We're obviously going to see that continue in the next four years, and I think we're going to see a movement away from these great, big, expensive, costly in blood and treasure commitments overseas. So that's Kerry and Hagel at State and Defense. The third nominee, John Brennan to run CIA, is very telling. Now, John Brennan was President Obama's counterterrorism and homeland security advisor. He briefs the president every day. He's extremely close to him. Even when Barack Obama goes to Hawaii in December for Christmas vacation, when he goes to Martha's Vineyard in August uh, for a summer vacation, John Brennan goes with him. Briefs him every day on the terrorist threat, sometimes briefs the press when he's feeling generous. <laughs> John Brennan is extremely close with the president, and his biggest policy claim to fame is having set up the drone program and the kill list. The drone program, as you undoubtedly know, though it's heavily shrouded in secrecy, it has been heavily reported on, sends these unmanned aircraft not only into places like Afghanistan and Pakistan to survey and in some cases to kill terrorist targets and occasionally innocent civilians as well, but American drones have been in Yemen, in Iran, in Somalia, in Libya, and there are really thorny legal questions here. You know, President George W. Bush always said the war on terror, the global war on terror, was a global war, legally speaking. That is to say the battlefield is everywhere, including the United States. And President Obama has stopped using the term global war on terror. But he hasn't stepped away from the legal arguments that George W. Bush embraced in the war on terror. And whenever anyone challenges the legal positions that the Obama administration is taking in the war formerly known as the global war on terror, the Obama administration works very hard to get judges to dismiss those cases, arguing that they compromise national security. So the question is, if American drones can fly into Yemen, Somalia, Mali, Libya, Iran, and kill people there, based on the president's secret kill list, can they do the same in Rome? or London, or Paris, or Chicago, or Los Angeles, or New York? These are questions that the Obama administration has not answered and has no desire to answer. And I'm not sure that they ever will be forced to answer them because so far judges have agreed with the Obama administration's argument that to answer these questions in court would compromise national security. But we can say this with some certainty. The elevation of Kerry and Hagel to state and defense and the elevation of Brennan to CIA means that the future of American warfare is going to be not boots on the ground, but drones in the air. So as we look ahead to the next four years in this inaugural week, I think it's appropriate to end by also looking back at where we were four years ago. The month that President Obama took office, the US economy lost 800,000 jobs. And it just kept getting worse for several months after that. 
And, and I know that living in Sarasota, you've all felt this firsthand. I remember during the presidential election, Romney was campaigning in Tampa, and I drove down here to do a story about housing. And I interviewed a real estate agent who talked to me about his business partner committing suicide when the housing market crashed, leaving behind a family. And I talked to a woman who had been kicked out of her home just before Christmas because the landlord had been foreclosed on and didn't tell her she was renting the place. So I know that you all felt this firsthand. And the economy is not fixed. But as the White House is quick to remind us, for more than two years, the economy has been adding jobs, too slowly, barely enough to keep up with new people entering the workforce. And some of the reason that the unemployment rate has dropped nationally is that people have given up looking for work. But the economy is growing. And economists expect that it will continue to grow and pick up steam, even if Congress cannot get these big deals done. This is one of the big secrets of the presidential campaign. Mitt Romney would say to great applause, if elected, I will create 12 million jobs over the next four years. And the truth is, economists of every stripe believe that three million jobs a year over the next four years is a pretty reasonable estimate of what to expect no matter who's in charge. <laughs> in October, the economist Mark Zandi told one of my colleagues, I feel confident that we're going to create 12 million jobs over the next four years, and we're going to feel a lot better about this economy regardless of who is president. And regardless of your politics, I think that is something that everyone can celebrate.